Tonight, our fight against coronavirus earns a tick from the PM, with the National Cabinet to make an earlier than expected call on easing restrictions. Australians have earned an early mark through the work that they have done. Also tonight, funerals held for two police officers killed in last week's freeway crash. Sabre rattling continues between the US and China over the source of the pandemic. And you wouldn't believe it, the sheer audacity of a sheep on the run for seven years. Good evening, Mary Geeran with ABC News. Australians have largely followed instructions and soon we are set to be rewarded. Political leaders have agreed to consider fast-tracking the removal of some of the rules that have kept most of the country at home for the last six weeks. They're not saying which ones, but it's the clearest sign yet that the nation's on the path back from the depths of the crisis. Here's National Affairs correspondent Greg Jennett. Australia's class of 2020 leaders convened once more, remote and secure in its cyber bunker, before the principal told the full assembly the news a fidgety nation's been waiting for. Australians have earned an early mark through the work that they have done. Google does track people. The data's convinced them. Generally, people are doing the right thing. Gold star behaviour means this time next week, social restrictions will start to be peeled back. They're all obviously being reviewed, and that'll bring about a welcome relief for the community. There are no hints on which ones will be the first to go, but some work, maybe non-essential shopping, and gatherings, especially outdoors, would be early options for easing. States and territories will decide. Until then... It'll help us stop the spread sooner. There's one activity, done digitally, that Scott Morrison's insisting must be practised by millions. Downloading the COVID Safe app. We need that tool. Downloading the COVID Safe app is the major obstacle. So it's over to you, Australia. Tracing the financial costs of the last two months takes care of itself. Treasury's still convinced unemployment will top 10%. 650,000 businesses have registered for the job keeper payment, and nearly a million people want their super early requests, totaling almost $8 billion. Add to that another $200 million for aged care homes, around $1,000 per resident. This will contribute towards the genuine extra costs that they are incurring as they manage COVID-19 outbreak. A constant regime of medical testing as well as a watchful eye on that vanishing curve of virus cases will remain. But the surest sign that a resilient Australia is almost back to rude good health, sporting competitions aren't far away either. We can't keep Australia under the doona. Seven days and a deluge of downloads are all that stand in the way. Greg Jennett, ABC News, Canberra. Stepping away briefly from all things COVID, Victorian police have today paid tribute to two of their own who died on the job last week. Constable Glenn Humphreys and Senior Constable Kevin King were among the four officers killed in a crash on Melbourne's Eastern Freeway. The two were honoured today by their families at private funerals. Nicole Asher reports. A simple gesture of compassion amid the grief. The Victoria Police senior chaplain hugs the partner of Constable Glenn Humphreys. In similar scenes to yesterday's funeral of leading senior constable Lynette Taylor, Constable Humphreys and senior constable Kevin King were farewelled with full honours. Victoria Police today celebrated their lives, but also honoured the ultimate sacrifice that they have made. Uh, both of these men love their jobs uh, and they love their families. And what we also saw today was that their families dearly loved them. The ceremonies were kept small because of the pandemic, but love and appreciation for the officers was on full display. Police paid silent tribute as a message from the Chief Commissioner crackled across the radio waves. Could I please ask members to form up at their police station and those on patrol to safely pull over off the road to observe a minute's silence. Roger, X-Ray Charlie, Charlie. These were two 
really outstanding men. I've seen that, I've heard that from their partners, from their families. We saw it today in the funerals. Senior Constable King was remembered for his love of his job, sport and music, but most of all, his family. Today we heard of the care and the kind-hearted soul that he was and the joy that he brought to his workplace. And Constable Humphreys as an adventurer adored by his partner and family. I know speaking to his mother, Katie, that he was a caring son. Somebody who, uh, when she was unwell, he reached out to her even from Melbourne every day. The final journey for Constable Humphreys to his home state of New South Wales will continue tomorrow. The funeral for Constable Joshua Presney will be held next week. Nicole Asher, ABC News, Melbourne. There were only three new coronavirus cases in Victoria over the past 24 hours, but the state government is standing firm on keeping the current restrictions, including at this stage on Mother's Day on Sunday week. But the government has thrown the struggling arts industry a lifeline with online music shows to keep audiences connected. Here's state political reporter Bridget Rollison. Thank you, Victoria. For keeping your distance an appreciation for everyone giving up so much. Thanks for staying in and helping out, because it's working. The state government's new campaign praises Victorians for their role in flattening the curve, and there's a reward for the good behaviour. This campaign is all about trying to uh, reinforce to Victorians that we are all in this together, and that the sacrifices we're making, the contributions we're making, staying apart is so, so important uh, to keeping everybody safe. A new online portal will stream Melbourne's live entertainment scene into Victorian homes, featuring six hours of live music every week. We have plans to kiss the sun at night. Opera. No, don't touch your face, don't touch your face, don't touch your face, don't touch your face. And tours of regional galleries. This is an opportunity to make sure that all Victorians can continue to participate and make sure that we are the cultural, live music, comedy, creative capital of our country. Grants will be handed out for creators to produce new online content. They're all getting paid and in a way it'll be a modern version of Triple J Unearthed and I'd be shocked that there isn't some international traction. The state's Deputy Chief Health Officer has received plenty of traction after her tweet comparing COVID-19 to Captain Cook's voyage to Australia. I found that, those sort of comments very disappointing. She clearly won't get the job as Chief Historian, but in, when it comes to medical advice, I mean, I applaud the work she's doing as a medical officer in Victoria. That's her expertise. I would strongly suggest she keep to that. But Victoria's Public Sector Commission is considering an investigation into the comments. This is a global pandemic. People have died, hundreds of thousands of people are out of work. My focus is not on the tweets of public servants. My focus is on getting to the other side of this. Bridget Rollison, ABC News, Melbourne. The Australian Defence Force says five personnel who recently returned from the Middle East have tested positive to coronavirus. One member was in mandatory quarantine in Brisbane when they were tested and the other four returned to Darwin this morning after testing positive while on deployment. The four members in the Northern Territory are being treated at Royal Darwin Hospital after returning on a defence flight this morning. There was also a number of personnel also on that flight that have disembarked and gone into that mandatory quarantine. Uh, and we hope that they uh, do not come down with coronavirus, but we wish them well and welcome them to the top end. Defence says it believes the illnesses are linked to several overseas contractors who've tested positive to the virus. It says other defence members on the flight are now in isolation. Donald Trump has threatened to impose new trade tariffs on China if it is found to have misled the world over the coronavirus outbreak. Meanwhile, Beijing has accused the US of trying to shift blame for its handling of the pandemic at home. North America correspondent David Lipson reports from Washington. On liberties that have been trampled upon. Another day in America, another armed protest. This one in Michigan saw dozens gain entry to the Capitol building to demand the state reopen. If people are going to die, I'm sorry, you only have as much power as you have. They want to go back to work, so do 30 million others. 
That's the number who've now filed for unemployment benefits in the past six weeks. It's not acceptable what happened. And now what we're doing, Jim, is we're finding out how it came out. US intelligence agencies have concluded the coronavirus was not man-made or modified, but in a statement said they're still examining whether it began through contact with infected animals or if it was the result of an accident in a lab. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. There's nothing that, that we have um, that would indicate that was the likely source. Now, you can't rule anything out. And if US investigators conclude China deliberately misled... It's uh, something that is going to have to be dealt with. Beijing has taken a dim view of such tough talk. At this particular time, they should focus on domestic epidemic control and international cooperation, rather than attack, smear and shift the blame to China. Your people are now dying. Chinese state media is mocking America's pandemic response. One former White House advisor says the coronavirus has cemented a sharper U.S. strategy on China. Coronavirus has actually galvanized the United States on both the left and the right that we need to make a change. And so, you know, whatever happens in 2020, I think you're going to see increased import uh, enforcement on Chinese companies. Whether all this talk will lead to action remains unclear. Donald Trump has raised the prospect of further trade tariffs, but China has shown before it's not afraid to retaliate. David Lipson, ABC News, Washington. Back home and the federal government's being urged to stop making changes to the JobKeeper package after it closed a loophole that saw teenagers eligible for thousands of dollars in windfalls. But business owners say the system is still unfair, with scores of casual workers still taking home more money than they'd ever have earned. Lewis Mullins is one of those sitting comfortably. It's been good for the bank account. Like, I can't complain about that. It seems there can be benefits in being stuck at home, studying university online. After tax, it's only 1300 which is still pretty good. Um, much, like, almost double what I'd make because I'm a full-time student and a casual worker. To avoid adding to unemployment queues, the federal government launched the JobKeeper payment, channelling cash to underworked workers. The business is effectively stepping into the shoes of Centrelink to ensure that $1,500 a fortnight gets from the government into the hands of those employees. But Brisbane restaurateur Sandro Romano was told by the ATO to give the full JobKeeper payment to school kids on one or two shifts a fortnight. Four, five, six times of their wage uh, that they were earning prior to uh, JobKeeper. The government announced on Friday night that um, those individuals would no longer be eligible for the scheme. The late change made it confusing for businesses last weekend. Tax expert Mark Molesworth sees potential trouble brewing. If the government keeps tinkering with the scheme, businesses will think that eligibility for the scheme is uncertain and that will prevent them from actually applying. So please stop changing the scheme. The federal government says it will reimburse businesses that have already made JobKeeper payments to people who've since been excluded from the scheme. But there are still some winners and losers. The Grattan Institute says that scores of casual and migrant workers have been left high and dry. The Treasurer has said they had to draw the line somewhere. We think maybe that line could have been drawn um, a little bit more generously. Lewis Mullins says his windfall will end up back in the economy. Yeah, 100%. And, I, you know, I still got to coals every other day and I'm still shopping at local businesses. Just what the government wanted. George Roberts, ABC News, Brisbane. Police have shot dead a man after he went on a stabbing rampage, injuring seven people in South Headland, north of Perth. Officers were called to the town's shopping centre at about 10 o'clock after several people had been stabbed with a large knife. Police tasered the man and asked him to drop the knife, but witnesses say he then lunged at the officers, injuring one. One of the officers is believed to have fired several shots. Uh, vision has been captured on uh, CCTV and on body-worn cameras worn by both officers. Commissioner Dawson says the man was a fly-in, fly-out worker in his early 30s and was known to police. The victims were taken to Headland Health Campus to have serious injuries, but all are stable. 
South Korea has recorded its first day without community transmission since the outbreak took hold on the peninsula. The nation has gone from one of Asia's hardest hit countries to a success story for containing the pandemic. North Asia correspondent Jake Sturmer reports. It's like a scene from before the pandemic. People gathering in public places in South Korea's capital, enjoying the sunshine at the start of the annual May holiday period. There are even travellers at domestic air terminals as the tourism industry continues to operate. But look more closely and you can see the precautions in place. Masks, hand hygiene and disinfection are the norm here. In February, South Korea was hit with one of the first coronavirus outbreaks centred on a religious sect in the city of Daegu. But authorities instituted a vigorous testing and contact tracing regime, finding people who'd been near infected patients and stopping them from spreading the virus further. Privacy concerns took second place to public health. It is a violation against privacy, but it is necessary. I myself check in the website to find out about new cases and where they are. Social distancing, like this outdoor exam, has also been rigorously applied. The payoff? South Korea has just had its first day with no community transmission, allowing restrictions on movement and business to be eased. For all of the success South Korea is having, it's a different story here in Japan. Dozens of new infections are being discovered every day and the government is set to extend the state of emergency it declared in April by a month. The government lockdown isn't compulsory and some people are ignoring it. Like South Korea, Japan also has a Golden Week holiday in early May. The coming days will be crucial if the country is to avoid a resurgence in infections. Jake Sturmer, ABC News, Tokyo. Russia's Prime Minister has gone into hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. Mikhail Mishushchin told President Vladimir Putin that he was temporarily stepping down to recover and would self-isolate. The pair last met a week ago. Mr Mishushchin was named PM in January and has been handling the country's response to the pandemic. More than 100,000 people have been infected there. Boris Johnson says the UK is past the peak of the outbreak there and promised a comprehensive plan for easing lockdown restrictions. The British PM defended his government's handling of the pandemic, saying the right measures were taken at the right time. Europe correspondent Samantha Hawley reports from London. Boris Johnson's appreciation for frontline workers comes with the enthusiasm of experience. And after five weeks away, he was back for the daily briefing and ready to deflect. I think we did the right measures at the, uh, at the right time. He has a national death toll nearing 27,000, but the Prime Minister insists early decisions were sound. By the way, when we, when we put in the lockdown, uh, it was earlier in the curve of our epidemic than it was, uh, relatively speaking, in, uh, in France, Italy uh, and, uh, and, and Spain. And he added he was dealing with a nation not ready to be confined to their homes. Don't forget that, you know, people are talking about the difficulties of lockdown. There's some very good questions about mental health, uh, uh, suicides. It's a, it's a very, very demanding thing. Boris Johnson came with some good news. The peak of the virus has finally passed. And next week, a roadmap for easing the lockdown will come. And he dismissed unfavourable comparisons that have the UK tracking to become the worst hit European nation. His medical chief agrees. We're through the first phase of this. There is a very long way to run for every country in the world on this. And I think let's not go charging in to who's won and who's lost. Boris Johnson has been widely criticised for acting too slowly to bring in the lockdown here. But now it does have some benefits. The British government can look closely at what's happening in nations across the Channel as they begin to bring in more freedoms. The German experiment of loosening restrictions has already seen a rise in the infection rate. Italy, the original European epicentre, will ease measures on Monday. Samantha Hawley, ABC News, London. 
And the European economy has shrunk at its fastest pace on record, with both France and Italy falling into recession. The grim figures reveal how much lockdown measures have affected the economy by turning cities into ghost towns. In Europe, a first estimate of the GDP data for the January to March quarter showed a contraction of 3.8 per cent. The European Central Bank is warning that the situation will only get worse. The sharp downturn in economic activity in April suggests that the impact is likely to be even more severe in the second quarter. France's economy had its worst quarterly result since World War II, shrinking 5.8 per cent. Italy also slid into recession after its economy shrank by 4.7 per cent. More finance now and investors have started the month with a bout of heavy selling. Here's Philip Lasker. Up in the Northern Hemisphere, they reckon November to April, winter, is the best time to hold stocks. So they say, sell in May and go away. It appears to have caught on in Australia. Today's dismal performance also wiped out most of this week's gains. Property groups were in the firing line, as were mining, energy and banking stocks. Austel was smashed after losing out on a $5.5 billion contract to build 10 US Navy frigates. And Australia's biggest wine company, Treasury Wine Estates, was hit with a second-class action for allegedly misleading the market about its poor performance in the US. The economic data in the US was pretty dismal as well, and that weighed on equities everywhere. The housing market is losing steam. Melbourne, Hobart and Canberra did not gain ground in April, but generally the moves were fairly modest. So when we look at the regional and national numbers, they are still positive for the month and year. But the storm is coming. Auction clearance rates have plunged, so price expectations aren't being met. And sentiment, which tracks house prices pretty closely, has also collapsed. The Australian dollar has taken a bit of a tumble right across the board. It's now well under 65 US cents. The local currency has been one of the world's strongest against the US dollar over the past six weeks. Our share market has underperformed during that time. The US Federal Reserve has undermined the American dollar by printing money, but much of last month's global optimism about economies beginning to open up and Australia's handling of the COVID-19 crisis has been channeled through the Aussie dollar rather than the share market. And that's finance. The PM says the NRL won't get any special treatment as it pushes ahead with plans to restart in under four weeks. The only club based overseas is yet to get the green light to fly into Australia and players have yet to sign off on a pay deal. But Queensland has agreed to allow teams to cross its border. The New Zealand Warriors are the key to unlocking the NRL season, but they're still yet to get an exemption to fly into Australia. That authority has not been provided and no amount of reporting it will change that decision. Um, that will be made on the basis of the border assessments of the, the Australian Border Force. Not even that keenest of rugby league fans is prepared to prejudge the decision. They're just doing their job and they'll do it in the same way and there'll be no special treatment for the NRL or any other code. But there was some good news today for the NRL after a meeting between the chairman, Peter Volandis, and the Queensland Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk. She said her chief medical officer was very impressed with our protocols and that they're very comprehensive. Um, so she has approved us both training in Queensland and playing in Queensland, which we did not expect. That means the other 13 teams can cross the border to play games and the Queensland sides won't have to base themselves in Sydney. Now we can plan knowing exactly where we will be and uh, people will be home with their families and in an environment that they're comfortable with and they know, so uh, that's a positive for us. But there are still some hurdles to overcome, which could put Tuesday's start date for training in doubt. The players are yet to agree to the NRL's pay offer, which is believed to be worth 80% of their usual wage, and they're still waiting for the league's biosecurity plans. Once they're finalised, then they'll be in a position to be put forward to the players, uh, and right now they're, they're just working through those final touches. Um, and, uh, and making sure that once it's presented to the players, it's a finished product. Regardless of how the NRL gets to its finished product in four weeks' time, the National Cabinet today confirmed fans will be locked out. David Mark, ABC News.
And when it came to the AFL, the Federal Cabinet today outlined the roadmap for teams to resume training together. Cabinet approved a set of three stages the AFL clubs will follow as they return. The next step would see the number of players able to train together increase from 2 to 10 with no physical contact allowed. State governments will decide when teams can step up their training. Well, for those of you bemoaning the current lack of hairdressing and waxing services, spare a thought for Tasmanian sheep, Prickles. She went missing from her farm during the 2013 bushfires, wandered back just recently and today had her fleece clipped for the first time. It took seven years to grow, but less than eight minutes to shear off. Prickles shorn for the first time in her life. When we first found her, she was absolutely round and we have been guessing at her weight for the last two weeks, wondering how much it'll weigh. She was just a lamb when she disappeared after the 2013 Dunalley bushfires destroyed the farm's boundary fences. The ball of wool walking back into her family's lives during a paddock birthday barbecue two weeks ago. It took five adults to corral her and get her into the back of the ute because she weighed an absolute tonne. Amazingly, her seven years of growth produced just 13.6 kilos of shorn fleece. Nowhere near the record belonging to Chris the Merino sheep in Canberra of more than 41 kilograms. Oh, I thought actually it would be a little bit denser than, than what it is and um, yeah, so it's probably better quality than I expected from a sheep with that much wool. It's very soft, fluffy wool, so uh, yeah, it is lighter than we thought, but the bulk is still quite amazing. While the fleece yield may be somewhat underwhelming, the money and awareness she's raised for refugees has been anything but. More than 200 people around the world joined a competition to guess the weight of her fleece, raising more than $12,000 for the UN Refugee Agency. When we caught Prickles, we were joking that she was an expert at social distancing. And then we were thinking about people in the world right now who don't have the luxury of that. And we looked up refugee camps and there can be up to 1,300 people sharing just one tap. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for reaching out and caring about others, including refugees. And Alice, we wish Prickles nothing but the best. After raising more than $12,000 for refugees in less than two weeks, Prickles has cemented her status as a celebrity sheep and earned herself a very comfortable retirement here in this pasture behind me. Edith Bevan, ABC News, Dunalley. Now that is a great yarn. With the weather now, here's Paul Higgins. Thank you, Mary. Well, the winter woolies will come in <laughs> handy this weekend and a window-rattling wind tonight for much of Victoria, including Melbourne and the peninsulas. Overnight, more snow in the Alps as it fell to minus four at Falls Creek, Mount Buller and at Mount Hotham. Now, the focus of the rain has generally moved to the south. That happened overnight. 53 millimetres at Donabuang, 48 at Wanthaggy and Monbolk. Today, 43 millimetres at Thorpedale near Moe and 31 at Lang Lang. 16 degrees, the best we could do. That was at Gabo Island, Malakuta, Mildura and Oyen. Wind gusts to 82 kilometres per hour on the bay today and that wind just whipped through you here in Melbourne where we hit 13 degrees at 2.43 this afternoon. At the moment, it's 11 degrees. Only a millimetre or two for most suburbs today, but up to five millimetres in our east and 11 millimetres at Officer, 15 millimetres down on Phillip Island. In Canberra, it felt like it was below zero all day. Windy in Adelaide, Canberra and Sydney. Here's the complex low with clouds circulating around it. The coldest day actually now looks to be over Western Victoria. These purple arrows you can see show up a gale to storm force winds along our coast. But as the low moves away, the wind will ease. That high will be over us on Monday. And as the wind eases, so will the showers, contracting to southern and eastern Victoria. But very windy with rain in Hobart and in Adelaide and Canberra, a shower or two. Windy in Sydney and in Brisbane and Perth, a sunny day. Back home, it'll be a cloudy Saturday, but those showers will ease in most areas, still falling as snow above 1,200 metres. It'll be a cool to cold day, although at least in double digits for most places, apart from Ballarat, 9 degrees there. 11 or 12 in the northeast and the Latrobe Valley. A fresh west to southwest wind. It'll be strong and gusty with damaging winds in these yellow areas, including east and southeast in Melbourne and the peninsulas. Gusts 90 k's, 120 kilometres per hour on the South Gippsland coast. Moderate flow 
flooding on the ovens and King Rivers. Westerlies on the bays, 30 to 40 knots. Squalls to 50 knots. Gales on the bays, Gippsland Lakes and West Coast. Storm force winds on other coastal waters. Strong and squally winds bayside and on the peninsulas tonight and early tomorrow. Fresh westerlies elsewhere. A few showers as well with the biggest falls over our east. 9 to 13 degrees. Then on Sunday, mostly cloudy with a shower or two, easing winds and 14, and it starts to warm up again next week, Mary. Thanks, Paul. Now, that's it for now. Have a great night.